Hey, good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year. Today is January 16th, 2017, and welcome back to Veterans Voices, a monthly talk show focusing on veterans' issues. I'm Nathan Johnson, the Contra Costa County Veteran Service Officer, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Gold Star Father and CalVet Link, Kevin Graves. Nathan, hey, Kevin. how you doing, bud? Good to see you. Happy New Year. You may have noticed we have a new facelift, and we've undergone uh, a new set in, in the studio tonight. I hope you're excited about it. We are. It's uh, a new transition for our set, something fresh and exciting for the new year. Uh, if you have any military memorabilia or a veteran-made product or something veteran-related, and you'd like to see it displayed on our set, we'd love to have it. We've got these nice shelves. We have a uh, shadow box up here from uh, a local veteran. Just contact us. Give us a call, send us an email, and we'll include it on the show. Uh, so a little bit about our episode tonight. Uh, it's a very exciting uh, episode, and tonight has literally gone to the dogs. This is our service animal episode. And you will be, you will, tonight you'll learn the difference between a service animal, a companion animal, or a therapy animal. And if you have questions about the topic, uh, or about service animals in general, or you want to share your unique story, reach out to us right now. We'll be live for the next hour. You can contact us by phone, email, anonymous chat. Uh, you can send us a message through social media, like Facebook. Uh, we're even live streaming on Facebook right now. Uh, so check us out on, on uh, Facebook, send us a message, call in, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, I'm gonna step back. I'm gonna get out of this episode, uh, out of this segment, and I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin, and he's gonna talk about service dogs with his uh, service dog, Sam, here, and take the lead with our first guest. Okay. Good luck, buddy. Thanks, Nathan. Before we start the discussion tonight, we'd like to share the ADA's definition of a service animal. The Americans with Disabilities Act defines it as dogs who are individually trained to do work or perform tasks for people with disabilities. Dogs whose sole function is to provide comfort or emotional support do not qualify as service animals under the ADA. However, some state and local laws define these re uh, regulations more broadly, so we encourage you to review the laws in your area. I'm now joined on set by Jen and Derek, who have personal experience with service dogs and have brought their dogs with them. Welcome, Jen, Hi. Derek, Thank you. Iron, and Sophie. Now, yeah, I can see you guys are excited. <laughs> so, Derek, tell us a little bit about um, the process that you went through uh, and why you felt like you wanted to, uh, to, to get Iron. So, uh, Iron and I, we've been together for almost two and a half years now. He's uh, three years old. I met him through an agency out of Southern California where they utilize um, children to help teach the dogs um, the different service animal um, attributes as far as opening doors, basic obedience, pushing wheelchairs, picking up crutches. And then after you meet the dog in, um, at the service center, um, they pick you. The dog actually is the one that picks you. So the litter, he came from the I litter. Um, so his name's Iron Isabel Ivy. So that school oh, does it that him. way. Sure. And um, fundamentally when I went down there, they did an assessment of me. They, they took a look at Iron. They took a look at the litter. I got to meet them all. But what it came down to, Iron ended up picking me and, and grew that attachment in our journey that we were able to talk with. Um, since then, Iron's been a blessing, man. He goes to work with me. He helps around the house. He helps my kids. He helps the community. And it's really poignant is when I walk into the different shelters that I work out of in the Central Valley, the joy that the kids or the, the people in that community succumb to when they see Iron. It's really neat to be a witness to it. And uh, it's nice to be able to bring Iron around as well as serving me, but also my fellow veterans I serve in the community. So it's pretty That's special. That's great. And Jen, your experience was a little different. Mm -hmm. uh, and yours was a little bit, was a, a while back too, wasn't it? Yep, Sophie is 13 uh -huh. now. And um, yeah, so I've had her since uh, she was a puppy. And I acquired her through a litter, um, not getting her for a service animal. And I think I was out of the Coast Guard for about three years at that point. And so I was um, in, a, in still a long transition after that. So I was in therapy at the time. And so, you know, discussing everything with my counselor about the, the, the dog and what joy it brings to me, but also, um, 
it was like an instant responsibility. So having been transitioned out and going through, um, you know, a roller coaster of everything at that sure. time, you know, so um, she just uh, started doing things and they noticed and we then at that point went and got her, she was trained for six months without me and then I continued the training for about a year and a half. Um, there was different levels of that training and it was done in Florida through, um, I think one of the first ones for the guide dogs and they started doing the other training at that time. And uh, since then, it's been a, a blessing. You know, she uh, can, she's trained to pick up on seizures and uh, what she did once to a woman. And I asked her if she had epilepsy because she was going up and nudging and licking and, and she's trained to bark at that point. And she, it's a different bark than as if there was like a prowler or someone that alerted her. It's, it's a sharp, clear bark. And it's just been amazing ever since. So you were kind of on the front end of, um, from what our discussions have been in the past, kind of on the front end of dogs, being, service dogs being used for things other than guide dogs for the blind and, and, and what we considered the conventional mm -hmm. uses of service dogs that go back for years and years and years. Right. And, uh, and I'll just share a little bit about Sam and I, and that is that I've had Sam for all of a under, I think under two months. I, well, actually, I got him the day after Thanksgiving. Right. And it's interesting, uh, Derek and I have known each other for eight, nine years yeah. now. Yeah. And when Derek got iron, he and I started talking about the benefits of service dogs. And, and one of our guests that's going to be on here tonight uh, had encouraged me and, and, and said that, that I would probably benefit from a service dog um, uh, for medical and other reasons. And, um, and so, Sam kind of found me, uh, not out of a litter, but found me because he was looking for a home. And uh, we, we had a couple of acquaintance uh, meetings where we kind of got to know each other. And we, it's amazing how quickly you can bond uh, or at least know that, you're, that, that you have a connection uh, with the animals. So I'm at the, I'm at the infancy. You guys have, have been there. I'm now doing what you did with Sophie years ago, and that is that I'm taking Sam and training him now to be my service dog. I'm self-training him, and um, so far it's been a huge responsibility. But I've enjoyed it, but um, it's still a major adjustment to your life. I, I, after a while, I know it becomes more routine, but um, he's been, he's already, um, my wife tells me that she already notices differences in my behavior just from from having them in a short period of time so they're extremely valuable and um, and I would encourage other people that are watching the show tonight to think about um, getting involved uh, from all different kind of aspects whether you volunteer with uh, an organization that works with service dogs mm -hmm. um, or whether you have a need for one yourself you know that's something you can work out with your doctor but uh, it's been, uh, it's been a, it's, it, I, I have a lot to look forward to. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited about it. Uh, so, um, so Derek, does Iron go everywhere with you? Yep, he goes everywhere I go. He goes to work with me. Some, you, he goes to work with me. He'll go to sporting events. He'll go to restaurants. He'll go to different meetings. Sometimes I, I, I don't take him if, he, if he, he's not feeling well or had an ear infection after we've been camping or something in that nature. Right. I won't take him, but generally everywhere I go, Iron goes with me, and it's really neat because even the people that are in the community, they've grown to accept Iron as part of me, and they're definitely open and receptive. My friends, the same thing. Iron goes, he's invited. Where's Iron? If he's not there, it's always that question. Same with on the baseball field or on the soccer field. And that's the good part about being ADA compliant. Um, there are there are there are legalities that protect us from be, and making sure, but we have a responsibility also to do it the right way, mm -hmm. to have the right kind of dog. So often you'll see um, people with uh, dogs with vests on, and um, they're yapping at somebody, and that's not a service animal. We know this, right? I mean, this is what a service animal does. It just it's just there for for you, and uh, pays attention to you, and um, uh, it's been. Uh, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting how easily they adapt to that. Mm -hmm. And s you just came back from a long trip with Sophie, didn't you? I did, yeah. And Arizona? Yeah, Arizona, and we drove back, so she was perfect in the car. It was, it was me, the one that was getting a little antsy and stuff on the way back. But yeah, she's uh, been to Cancun. She's been all over, actually. Really? So to Mexico? She, 
Uh -huh. Did you have a quarantine issue or anything with that? No, no quarantine. She, um, they do require certain shots sometimes. Uh -huh. I've never really had a problem with the airlines so much, but uh, like I said, for 13 years, she's been a uh, service animal. Recently, in the last five, I would say, you know, there was a few things that came up, but with the proper documentation, ID and everything else um, up to date, it, it makes it for a faster ride. So they have to kind of keep I up. I think that's an important point, though, is to have uh, the proper documentation, have the proper mm -hmm. licensing, um, go through the proper process to make sure that you you um, you can be uh, can be responsible. And and Derek and I both working within the veteran community right. uh, for a living. Um, uh, I want to make sure that I'm I'm a good example to other veterans on the differences, just so people can see what they need. Not everybody needs a service dog. Not everybody has tasks that they need to have a service dog perform for them and sometimes they just need an, an emotional support dog or an animal and that's a whole different environment and um, I think we're going to have we're going to discuss that later on in the show a little bit more but um, it's been uh, very uh, uh, it's very interesting uh, look at these these dogs are unbelievable <laughs> Uh, so, uh, and I find the same thing with you. I, I was in, a, I was in a, a convalescent hospital the other day and um, I was visiting a family member and uh, I walk in with Sam and everybody thinks I'm there to like let them pet my dog. I think I should have gotten a Doberman because then nobody would want to pet him because right now at the training to try to keep, no, I'm sorry, he's working. Thank you. Yes, he's a beautiful dog. You get a lot of that uh, constantly, people wanting to uh, uh, not, not really understand what a service dog is. And, and how, how do you de guys deal with that? Because you help me out here. How do you deal with that when people constantly want to pet your dog? Or So in my, the nature of my needs for Iron, I wanted him also not only to support me, but my fellow vets in the field and in the community. So what I always do out of that whole respect found them is, Miss, do you like dogs? Yes or no, they'll tell me. And then I have Iron visit. So he gets, his command is to visit when he wants. So he knows, because if he walks up to somebody who doesn't like dogs or may be afraid and his automatic reaction would be to jump on him, that would not be etiquette and that would not be proper, especially for a service animal. But in my case, I wanted Iron to bring joy to others and relaxation to others, whether we're in a therapeutic session or a discussion or just even in the environment. Everything mellows out when Iron's around with others. So he's trained and I give him permission to visit my friends and I literally use the command, Iron, visit. So, so and this is advanced training. I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm sure Excuse this me. is advanced training, but um, that I, I would hope that that would be kind of some of the some of the chores that would Sam would be a benefit that Sam would have also. Um, uh, you know, I when I was thinking about doing this, I had to contact my employer, let them know, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Um, get the support of your direct supervisor, make sure that they're on board with it. Although. You just as a courtesy, you yeah. just want you want everybody to buy into the program, and and they have the state of California, uh, my my the California Department of Veterans Affairs is understands that I have Sam and that uh, and he said as long as my county veteran service where I'm housed didn't have a problem with it, and yes. I said I got those guys taken care of no problem. It's amazing how far they've come. So like before when I had Sophie, there really wasn't that program. I don't believe anyways that I knew of in the VA. So I know my next dog, I'll definitely be going through the VA with all the assistance that they you know, have for you trained already and and uh, helping with shots and food and stuff. And a so, lot yeah, of the nonprofits do, do do that. They'll have mm -hmm. sponsors that work with them. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and and they'll sponsor a dog and it helps defer some of the costs for some of the veterans. Um, uh, uh, Sam came from an organization that was doing that. But but um, oh, do we have a call? We, we have a call. Caller, do you have some questions for us? Is it Rex? Ray, sorry. Um, Ray, are you there? Yeah, it's Raymond. <laughs> hey, Ray, are you there? I'm here. What, what can we do for you? What do you have, what question do you have for us? Or, or what do you want to share with us tonight? Um, yeah, I'm actually learning because I don't know much about service dogs. So this is uh, very interesting to me as a veteran. And I guess my question would be, is there a particular kind of dog that makes a better service type dog than others? So some yes. of the some of the research would suggest, I mean, and there's I'm not negating any other breeds, but you'll find a lot of golden retrievers and labradors, not to negate any other breed. 
Um, the goldens, from what I was told in the research I've done, they mellow out a little bit sooner than the Labradors do. So even as early as a year, their whole puppy spunkness mellows out a little bit more and they're more receptive to training. Um, versus the Labrador, they tell, they've told me when I was doing the research, it's a little bit longer before they mellow out. The other ones are, are golden doodles, are amazing. Some of the hybrid breeds, or even just the poodles, are a very intelligent, loving animal. Um, so I would definitely start there with the Labradors and the Golden Retrievers, and not just because of me and Iron, but also look at the Poodles and, uh, and their phenomenal animals as well. Ray, Ray, where are you calling us from, Ray? This is my question. Ray, where are you calling from? I'm calling from the uh, Cocoa Beach, Florida area. Well, well, I think you get the Long Distance Award tonight. Thank you for, for tuning in. We really appreciate it. What I would recommend you do is in your area, I would, I would, get, I would look up a nonprofit uh, that might work with service dogs and talk to them. And really, the, dog, uh, the breed and the dog depends on, on who's doing the training. And some have, some have favor. I know some that use shepherds and other types of dogs, too. So, Ray, I thank you very much for your phone call. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. So, great discussion tonight. Thanks for you guys for sharing with us uh, what Thank your you. personal experience with your dogs. Uh, we, we've received many requests this month to share upcoming veterans events with our viewers. And we're gonna try to share these throughout the show a little bit better than we have in the past. So, we'll be announcing some of these events throughout our show. All events can be found on our Veterans Voices calendar. First one I wanna share with you is January 29th is the start of the War Comes Home exhibit. This photography and written correspondence exhibit will be held at the Museum of San Ramon Valley and will go on through April 9th. For more info, go to museumsrv.org or call 925-837-3750. We will return shortly after this video break. Eric went to Iraq with his father's words branded on his brain. My father, you know, one of the, he's probably one of the person or he is the person I respect most in my life. And his father's words. He said, son, he goes, you've got 11 guys. He said, make sure you bring them all back. And that's the last thing he told me. <clears throat> and they didn't all come back. They didn't all come back. They didn't all come back. I feel guilty because I'm here. Survivor's guilt and the nightmares. I've woke up numerous times hitting my wife or just hitting, you know, obviously she's laying there. Or just in cold, cold sweat. I can't tell you how many times we've had to change the sheets because it's like a, just a puddle of water. But when the doctors told him you have PTSD. They've tried de tons of medicine with me and a long time ago I'd throw it right in the trash can. Since then, nothing has helped, nothing. But then Eric heard about Canines for Warriors, a nonprofit here on our first coast. They match custom trained service dogs to warriors with PTSD. And that takes us back to the chair. Now Eric is here talking with me about tough stuff and his dog Gumbo under strict command. So, stay. Gumbo's feet, you see, glued to the ground always obeys. But watch now. Eric's remembering the doctor saying you have PTSD and you need help. Oh, I'd get mad. I'd get, you know, extremely ugly words come out of my mouth and told them, you know, just because they open a book, they just can't, they can't <laughs> put that stigma on me of what supposedly, you know, I have just because what that's what their books say and stuff like that. I was like, there has to be, you, you can tell I'm getting a little agitated. Gumbo senses Eric's upset even before Eric realizes it. Amazing instinct and the power to stop panic attacks and tackle PTSD. All right, welcome back to Veterans Voices tonight. We're discussing service animals for veterans. And I gotta say, so far this episode's made me really tired. Watching these dogs just lay down. I know, dogs sleep. Light, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could just do that right now. Let them run the show. If you'd like to share your story, so far we've had some people call in. Uh, we just had Ray from Pebble Beach, Florida. Fantastic Ray, and I think he joined us on Facebook Live. So if you're watching us here on Contra Costa TV, CCTV, you can also join us Facebook Live. If you have a question, call, email, you want to share your story, it's a fantastic opportunity. This is a great topic. We're talking about dogs. Man's best friend, woman's best yeah. friend. It's a fantastic, fantastic episode. So we've got a question on Facebook. And before we uh, introduce Matt, our next guest, we'll take this question. If you already have a dog you love, 
is it allowed to have them is it allowed to have them trained as a service animal or an emotional support animal for use for yourself? Mm -hmm. And so we'll get to that. We'll, we'll address that question, I think, in this conversation in probably our third segment. Yes. Uh, so thank you, Tito, from Facebook. We'll get to our third segment, in which we'll actually have programs that offer dogs and training for dogs. And maybe they can talk a little bit about how you can take a dog that you already have and turn it into a service dog. So great question. Thanks uh, for the question, Tito, on Facebook. And we'll take your questions as well. Call in, uh, send us an email, Facebook, whatever. Uh, so we're now joined by Matt Decker. And Matt is a mental health professional for the VA. And he's brought his service dog, Larson, with him tonight. So welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Matt, and, and about Larson, or, and how you interact. OK. Uh, you already know my name. I yeah. did six years in the Marine Corps, one tour in Iraq from 06 to 07. Okay. Uh, knew when I got out, I wanted to continue serving. Eventually ended up as a social worker. Bounced around the social work field for a while. Things make good social workers. We, we, you know, we try. Action-oriented, solution-focused. Yeah. Uh, and ended up working for the Concord Vet Center. Fantastic place to work. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about the Vet Center program because I think that's important in the discussion about uh, your dog, Larson. What's, what's the Vet Center do? So the Vet Center does readjustment counseling for combat vets mm -hmm. that have uh, one form of combat deployment. There are also a handful of other ways that you can qualify for services. Mm -hmm. um, and what we do is we try to meet the veteran wherever they are in their process for readjustment. Mm -hmm. And we assist them in getting from where they are to where they want to be. Yeah, look at this. <laughs> yeah, we know where he wants to be. So how's Larson a part of this, uh, this work Larson, that you do? No. So Larson and I work inside the mental health field to ensure that we get a good good connection with the veterans that both he and I serve. Frankly, he's the better therapist Okay. when it comes right down to it. Yeah. Uh, he, he probably uh, is, is all about the fact that yeah. you know, bright lights, it's yeah. a little bit nerve wracking. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, you know, my heart's pumping a little bit and he picks up right. on that a lot faster. Uh, he's, right. he's not the first dog I've worked with. Uh, I, I do work with another dog as well. This one's actually been qualified as uh, my service animal through the VA as a reasonable accommodation. Okay. Uh, how I use them is I allow my client to set the boundary for the dog. If the dog would like to climb up in their lap and they don't want it, they have to tell the dog no. Mm -hmm. If they're okay with the dog climbing in their lap, Larson loves to do this on the couch. Yep. Uh, right. When he, they, he picks up on anxiety, yeah. he rolls right up onto the couch. Mm -hmm. We'll usually lay across a veteran yeah. and the veteran will just sit there yeah. and pet. Sometimes we do meditation. We do deep breathing exercises. We talk about what I like to call the biological feedback a dog can give you. Dogs don't lie, they don't cheat, and they may steal a chicken wing every now and then, right. but for the most part, they're not gonna steal from you. Yeah. You can't get any more honest feedback out of any other stimulus. Uh, you can lie, you can lie. I do a lot. Yeah, this guy, I don't ever. <laughs> this guy, this guy can't lie. He's gonna tell you exactly how he feels, he's gonna tell you exactly how he sees it. Yeah. If you hurt his feelings, He's, he's going to tell you that you hurt his feelings, and he's going to come back, and he's going to re-engage. He's going to say, hey, are we okay? Better communication here than any of my friends. Uh, we have a tendency to put a lot of words into things when really all, it, all that needs to say is, I messed up, I'm sorry, we're good. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Larson. If he messes mm -hmm. up, he might, uh, a, a client might yell at him. Mm -hmm. He'll turn around. Politely apologize with a nice glance, a look, yeah. that gaze is really important, and then re-engage. You know, so this is fantastic. We got a, a great guest on here. We got Matt Decker from the Concord Vet Center, and he's talking with his dog Larson. He's talking about his, his work with his dog Larson and how he helps veterans uh, in a mental health setting, uh, readjustment counseling. Mm -hmm. And most of these veterans are dealing with military-related trauma, combat trauma, sexual trauma. I was going to say, so this is not something that happens instantly, though. It takes a while for this uh, relationship to develop, correct, between you and the dog? In, in, in other words, sometime, it took, it took, did it take a while for you when Larson did a certain thing to know that what he was really was saying was that you were the one that he was adjusting? I mean, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't yes. like him being different. It was you're being different, and I'm trying to tell you that. Yes. Since he can't use the words, right. I have to read his body language and yeah. his intent. So... We've been together six months. We're working closely. We, we've got really good communication. 
I can tell when somebody's really amped up and they're they're got a lot of hot energy to them. Sometimes he'll shy away. I can ask. So we well, got a question, and, and this is I love that we're talking about this because I'll share my own story in a little bit, but. We've got a question here. So Lance from Phoenix, and this came over our chat. So this is fantastic. This is someone who's watching Contra Costa TV remotely uh, from our website, ContraCostaTV.org. And they've submitted a question through our chat function, which you can do right on our website. It's a fantastic way to submit an anonymous chat. But this, in this instance, we got Lance from Phoenix, Arizona. And Lance is an Army veteran. Thank you, Lance. And uh, we hope you're enjoying that warm weather out there. It's cold here. How many service dogs, and this is addressed to you, Matt, how many service dogs or therapy, therapy dogs have you trained? And you, can you give us some examples of how therapy dogs do with family and kids of service members? Uh, so two questions there. And third question, where did you get Larson? So let's go back to the first question. How many, how many, how many dogs have you had that are in this kind of role? I, I personally have two dogs that are in this role. Larson is one. I have a Rottweiler German Shore Hair Pointer mix named Maggie that also works with me. Okay, off. Good boy. And as far as how the question was, how many? So that, how many did you, dogs? Well, yeah. let me ask you this. Did you train Larson? Or no. You? Okay. That, I did not train Larson. But this is your second there dog. We go. This, this is the second dog, yes. How does he do with family members, uh, particularly children? So you've, you've talked about with the veteran, but, but what about with the kids or with the spouse? He has, uh, he lives with me and my wife, obviously. We have uh, friends that have a two-year-old and a six-year-old. Yeah. He's seen everything in my office from infants to teenagers. When he puts that vest on, is, is he in a different role? Because I would imagine a dog around kids would generally get excited and want to go play with them. When he puts the vest on, does he kind of, is he, is he different? Is he in a professional role? We, tr at my house, we tr always try to make sure that the dogs are always behaving mm -hmm. like dogs, socially appropriate for humans yeah. at all times. Yeah. So there is a, a slight change, especially in his walking. He pulls yeah. without it just a little bit, but uh, for the most part, and he, Keeps it, he keeps it really uh, uh, routine. Where, where did you get Larson? We got Lars, Larson from Paws for Purple Hearts. He was donated to me as a re-careered service dog. Okay. Re-careered? Re-careered. What was his first career? He was training for mobility work. Oh, okay. uh, uh, originally, uh, I believe they wanted to yeah. put him with a quadriplegic. Okay. And I've heard re-career re dogs, because re sometimes uh, military dogs yes. uh, or police dogs are re-careered into service stroke. Uh, so I want to thank Lance uh, from Arizona. Thank you so much, Lance, for watching the show and for your great questions. And I want to encourage many uh, uh, that are out there watching the show to call in with your, your comments. I just want to say this is so cool because my dog Mandy used to go to the vet center with me, and I shared that earlier with everyone. And just like Larson does, Mandy was just so important to not only me, but to the veterans I served. And she would do exactly what Larson just did. She'd try to jump up in my lap, and I often, oftentimes I didn't know what she was doing. I thought she was misbehaving. I'd tell her, get down, get down, Mandy, what are you doing? But I didn't know she was reacting, kind of like Larson is doing now. We're out of time, unfortunately. This has been fantastic. Matt, appreciate your service, Semper Fi. Appreciate the work that you do at the Vet Center every day, you and Larson together. Thank you for being a guest on the show tonight. Thank you. We're going to keep the promise alive. All right. Good to have you on set. Larson, good to see you, buddy. <laughs> He's ready to go. Look at him. About Face is back this year with free painting workshops for veterans. Workshops start on February 1st and go until the end of March. To sign up or get more information about About Face, and you might remember them because we've had them as guests on the yeah. show before, visit ac5.org or call 925-646-2278. We will, we will return after, uh, after this brief message from Pets for Vets. We'll still be taking your call, so please call, chat, email. We would love to hear from you. My name is Casey Romero. I am a Navy veteran and the proud owner of Jazzy. I was an aviation ordnance man, so I worked around bombs and missiles and bullets, and I got out about eight years ago. I had just been diagnosed with PTSD, and sometimes I would be afraid, and I kind of felt like I was in a shell. I needed a battle buddy, somebody that's gonna be there for me, and honestly, there's no better option than a dog. My name is Clarissa Black, and I'm the founder and executive director of Pets for Vets. 
Pets for Vets is a national nonprofit, and we rescue shelter dogs and match them with returning veterans to help with post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, anxiety, and depression. One of the unique aspects of Pets for Vets is that our dogs are rescue dogs. They're from shelters or from rescue groups, and I think that it's so important for the veterans because they've gone through so much, and they have this kinship with the dog that they're getting paired with. They feel like they can now provide that protection, they have that companionship. I actually had one veteran, he said to me, if they can heal, we can heal. Before Jazzy, it was a little different. I didn't have the same strength that I have nowadays. And Pets for Vets does an incredible job matching the symptoms a vet might have with a dog that I'm so grateful for. One of the unique aspects of Pets for Vets is the matchmaking process. And so this isn't a cookie cutter program or a one size fits all, any dog is going to work. It's actually the right dog. And so it really takes skilled trainers who understand how to figure out what that veteran is looking for, what they need, and what's gonna kind of bring out the best for each veteran. One veteran didn't let me know that he had nightmares, um, but one day he called me and he said, you know what, I was having a really bad night terror and she woke me up, she stood over me until I calmed down. And it was just, that was one of those moments where like, this is, this is why we do this. She boosted my confidence to get married and have a daughter. Now I feel like I can overcome anything. I feel like when there's fireworks going on, I, I feel safe and I feel lonely. I have my buddy right there for me. I think it's one of those programs that everybody can get on board with and we're rescuing shelter dogs and we're helping veterans and it's a win-win. It's two ways to um, be able to, to make a difference. My bond with Jazzy, it's incredible. When I come home from work, she's always there at the door waiting for me. And it feels, honestly, when I see her, when I open that door, it feels like I just got home from a deployment. And She's my best friend. She's my battle buddy. People ask me questions about her, where I got her from, and it's really nice that I can tell them about Pets for Vets. Anything that helps out veterans, we really don't have much help out there. Bring in a companion to a veteran, to their home, and changing their lives, it's priceless. Jazzy, she makes me feel secure, confident, she makes me feel like I can conquer the world. Welcome back. If you're a new viewer, I'd like to point you to our homepage where you can sign up to take part in our viewer advisory panel, a very important program that we do. This is a group of viewers who provide our show with valuable feedback and opinions so we can make the show stronger and better and more valuable to you our audience. The time commitment is very small and you'll be emailed a short survey every month after watching the show. Viewer participation and support are a key in making our show a success. If you're just tuning in, tonight's topic is service dogs. And we're now joined by Army veteran Mary Cortani from Operation Freedom Paws and Steve Burdo from Contra Costa County Animal Services. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for being here tonight. So now we have the experts on stage that can <laughs> Take all that information that we disseminated earlier and make sure that we all have it in a, in a, in a, in a good path and that we're accurate in, in, in what's going on. Mary, I know uh, you and I have known each other for quite a while. Yes, we have. And I know that uh, you um, actually were a dog trainer in the Army. Tell us a little bit about your history uh, so we know a little bit about your background. So I'm, a, I'm from a different era. I was tail into the Vietnam era. Um, I served for nine years on active and six years in the reserves. And I learned how to train dogs for police work, so military police work, but we trained all branches of service. I was one of the first Army female canine handlers. I was invited back to be an instructor, so one of the first Army female um, instructors. So I've trained sentry dogs, police dogs, SAR dogs, narcotics, explosive detection dogs, contraband dogs, um, and got out, went into high tech, and then got a call from a Marine, which was what started Operation Freedom Paws, because if you've ever talked to somebody who feels like they have no hope and has been on waiting lists for other organizations and you're compelled to serve, it's your life, you step up and you take care of it, and that's what started Operation Freedom Paws. When was that? How long, how long ago was that? Uh, so, started in January of 2010. We became a nonprofit in September of 2011. So, celebrating five years as a nonprofit and seven years as an organization. Congratulations. And congratulations on that because that's perseverance in the nonprofit world. Yes. 
Um, but you do some wonderful things, and I could go on and on about you, but I won't because. Um, Steve, tell us a little bit about what you do in your program. Oh, sure. Uh, at Contra Costa Animal Services, you know, we are the both law enforcement wing of uh, the county's animal services division, which means we're uh, responsible for enforcing state and county laws with regards to animal welfare in Contra Costa County. On the other end, um, we also do the adoption and transfers of adoptable animals animals, um, finding loving homes for them. Uh, we also provide an array of services for the community, including spay, neuter, um, vaccination services, um, as well as public education. One of the things we were really, really happy to do uh, this past summer was we brought in the 109th medical detachment of the Army Reserves. Uh, these are the veterinarians um, that are in combat areas or areas where the military is providing relief. Um, it's important because these uh, servicemen and women, they have um working dogs with it embedded within their units that perform tasks that they need to be able to have proper handling and maintenance of those uh, dogs, making sure they get the proper uh, care that they need, um, as well as knowing how to properly restrain and vaccinate animals, um, prefer, perform any surgeries that they need to do if they're in a combat or a relief area, such as Katrina, where they're having to um, help people reunite with their animals or rescuing them from a flooded area. I imagine they also come into play with some of the fires, some of the animals that get let out at the fires and stuff that we have here in California? Absolutely. Um, you know, they played a, a huge role in the Lake County fires sure. a couple of years ago. And, and you know, our vets and our, our team at Contra Costa Animal Services was really, you know, honored to have the opportunity to help uh, our servicemen and women hone their skills so that, you know, when they are called upon, they are the top practitioners in their field. Fantastic. So it's not just a dog pound. No, no. no. Kind of vet, much, we got to we make sure we understand exactly. we're talking vets and vets. We got we got two different kinds of vets going on here. <laughs> um, Mary, there were some things that were some questions were asked earlier on the show, and I want to make sure that we get the right answers out to these. Um, uh, so we talked about the types of animals uh, or types of dogs that are the best or that can be used for service dogs. Is there is there a specific? Do you have more information on that? Yeah, so um, there is no specific breed. Okay. It really comes down to the dog. So just like people are individuals, dogs are individuals. And the difference between a service dog versus a pet companion or therapy dog is as simple as this. A service dog must perform tasks and it must be inward focused on one individual, the person that it has helped mitigating the medical condition for. The therapy dog, the companion dog, the emotional support dog, the pet, they don't have to be just focused on one thing. They can be focused on the outside world. So they can be social with other animals. They can be social with other people. Um, and because the, there's not a condition there that they have to mitigate or, you know, keep from going into a crisis. Now, that's not to say that a highly trained service dog who is performing those tasks, who is in tune to its handler, can't be used in a therapeutic role to serve other veterans or other people. But it should be kept to a minimum because every time you interrupt the dog from focusing on you, and I'll give an example, someone with a traumatic brain injury that suffers from a seizure, right? The dog's nose is gonna sense that, that seizure before it occurs. Get, earlier, right. Right, get the, the person to a safe space so they don't face plant and so if you're distracting the dog and the dog is out visiting how's it supposed to alert you mm -hmm. right because now it's in conflict it's it's a light switch you can't turn the light switch on and off you can't ask them one minute to take care of you and then the next minute to take care of everybody else so you want to mitigate that as to how much of it you do it doesn't mean they're not capable of it Right? It just means, what do you really want the dog to do for you? And if it's to help you with your medical condition, and there's a lot of invisible disabilities, whether it's diabetes or epilepsy or post-traumatic stress or military sexual trauma or anxiety or a combination of that, to everybody else, that person looks normal, right? And so they don't know that the dog 
is gently touching their hand or putting a paw on them or creating a block in front of them to keep them from going front, forward or putting on the brake saying, hey, wait a minute, you got to sit down. So this is some good expertise, and I want to invite our audience again to tune into this. And, and now's an opportunity to, to ask the Contra Costa County Animal Services or uh, a nonprofit organization uh, a good question. We've got years of experience here, so your, your phone uh, questions over email, chat. In fact, we, we've got an anonymous email here that we'll address. Uh, are there organizations that help, <clears throat> excuse me, are there organizations that help offset the cost of future ailments that are breed specific for the service animal. As an example, uh, if if a golden retriever is prone to something like cancer, or golden anything to help help to take care bar. of the dog, um, if there's any um, costs. Uh, Contra Costa Animal Services, we have a program, it's our pet retention program, where if uh, folks are experiencing uh, any financial difficulty with, you know, regards to care for their animals or providing adequate food, um, we, we have a fund that we're able to help people on, help people out with uh, there. In terms of service animals specific, it's not unique to service animals. Um, that's something we would often for, offer for everybody in the community. However, there are um, a lot of programs out of uh, places like Maddie's Fund and ARF that mm -hmm. are um, providing that type of support. Um, sometimes they might not be brick and mortar programs, but if you know you were to contact them and let them know of your situation, if they didn't have one of those full on programs to support that, uh, I'm sure that they would be able to so find a way to help. Maddie's right. Fund is a national nonprofit organization, right? And ARF is, uh, is a local organization local. here. Yes. So yeah, if you're watching from Florida, or, or many of our callers have called from all over the United States, Maddie's Fund might be a resource. And we appreciate the email. And I want to go back to another email that I think was asked earlier. Maybe you addressed it. Sam was kind of giving Can me I some attention earlier. Thing? Oh, so, sure. Go ahead. That question. Go ahead. So depending on where they're at, um, there are other small nonprofits that set themselves up as an angel fund um, for whether it's a service animal or things like that. If the animal is a pet, um, there are very few uh, nonprofits that will help out with that. The, the um, video we saw earlier from um, uh, Pets for Vets, they have sponsors uh, for their right. animals, and those yeah. sponsors pay, f help defer some of the costs. And Sam came from Pets for Vets. Came from, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm not actually taking, um, making use of that. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. Sam's, I'm taking care of Sam myself. But yeah. yes, he did come from Pets for Vets, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but, but they're, but, and, and they're not, service dogs those are uh, emotional support dogs that they provide therapy dogs that they provide and they do have sponsors and so you have to check with each individual nonprofit and see who does who does do that well and each each nonprofit because we're not a traditional but right. we do things a little different we don't give you a trained dog we train the dog we train you to train the dogs in a 48 week program but so that goes back to the other question that I think Tito asked can you take a dog that someone already has and begin training them if as a it has dog. the right temperament drive and personality not every dog will make okay. a good service dog how do you determine that it, there's a for us there's a 30 step process that okay. we evaluate um, that has to do with those three things the temperament the drive and the personality drive has to do with workability so for somebody who has mobility issues like even our veterans with post-traumatic stress a lot of them have mobility it's a back it's a knee it's a leg it's a shoulder mm -hmm. so is the dog willing to go pick up something and bring it back to you can it mm -hmm. be encouraged to bring it back because right. if somebody's walking with a cane and they drop the cane can the dog pick up the cane and give it to them mm -hmm. right if they drop the keys not every dog wants to do that mm -hmm. right you throw a ball sometimes the dog right <laughs> um, sometimes the dog looks at you guys right. you go get it but and so for us we have everything from toy poodles mm -hmm and chihuahuas all the way up to Great Danes, including pit bulls that um, are trained to detect peanuts or diabetes or epilepsy. Uh -huh. Very, um, important. Very so, important. But if you're looking for help with medical, look in your local area. There's a lot of veterinarians that are willing to help step up and help care for and reduce costs. Yeah. And, and I would add to that, you know, the, w there's a lot of talk tonight about the difference between emotional support dogs and, and working dogs. And, um, you know, we actually provide emotional support dog tags at Contra Costa Animal Services. Any dog can be an emotional support dog if you as the individual have a bond. The, the human-animal bond is certainly a special one and it manifests in mm -hmm. unique ways. Um, 
so you could have a you know chihuahua that makes you feel comfortable and if your family doctor provides you a note that says you know hey you know the chihuahua you know makes them e at ease in social situations we can then provide you with one of those tags and, and I'd like to take a minute to talk about our program because as as we talk about the animals for emotional support and working dogs, um, it also goes the other way around. Uh, most people are familiar with the emotional support dog that may be used for a service member with PTS PTSD or perhaps a Dallas Cowboy fan after yesterday. Um, and then you have <laughs> your, your working dogs that actually perform tried and true tasks like a guide dog for the blind. But you know what people don't realize at Animal Services, we have animals that are coming in from traumatized backgrounds as well. Mm. And um, they need just mm -hmm. as much emotional support and human interaction, um, as, just as much as a vet with PTSD oh, could yeah. benefit from that of an animal. I remember that from my, again, I mentioned her earlier, but my black lab, Mandy, uh, you could tell before we adopted her, which we, she came from a shelter, she had had a rough life and that kind of carried forward. She was very timid when we first got her, wouldn't bark, wouldn't yeah. do anything that a normal dog would expect. But we've got a question, another question here. Mary, this would be a good one for you to answer. How do you convince the veteran or handler that they have to be 100% responsible to keep a strict routine? It, it's um, for us we have a contract to understanding and uh, there's a long interview process um, and we ask a lot of hard questions you know just because you think you would benefit from a service dog doesn't mean that you really would uh, you have to make the commitment it is a life-changing situation just like having a kid the dog has to come first you have to allow extra time so it's having those hard conversations it's um, really explaining um, what the difference is having them speak to other handlers who have gone through it um, but to, to circle back around you know that hard conversation and making that commitment and keeping the strict routine there's there's a little room for for you know fudging um, but uh, emotional support animals are covered by housing, so the HUD laws, right? Um, and that's a different letter from a doctor. Uh, even a therapist can write that. To have a service dog that performs tasks, there has to be a medical need. Yeah, right. Now, it Very can be a psychiatrist or an MD yeah. to cover both sides right. of it. I want to interrupt you because we just have about 30 seconds and we have one last chat question. I want to thank everyone who's contributed tonight, by the way, for the comments and questions. So go ahead, Kevin, take it. <laughs> Oh, what is the cost to a veteran with Operation Freedom Paws? Uh, this is a question that comes from Grace in Fresno. She has a son that might benefit from a service dog, it sounds like, and they're on a limited budget. So how do you guys operate down there? We don't charge. We rely on donations and the fundraising. Uh, the shelter costs. for for cost, um, we're currently going through a fee schedule redux, and we are working on a significantly reduced adoption fee for veterans. And every Veterans Day, the week of Veterans Day, we do a free adoption special Fantastic. for all veterans. Great. They have to go through the application process and have the letter with us, though. Bef I, I, and I know we're, we're just about out of time for this segment, but I need I need to, under, under full disclosure, say that I'm actually working with, Mar Mary is helping me with Sam. Sam is an Operations Freedom Paws dog. And the commitment is, and, and their, their program is down near Morgan Hill. My commitment is, is that I'm, I go down there to complete this course to make sure that I am I am getting this uh, getting the training. The Sam's getting the training, but let me tell you, as I found out, it's not you're not training the dog, you're training the trainer. Yeah. So to go back to that question, how do you get that responsibility? I've got to commit to it and and, and make that commitment, yeah, and I'm the one that's learning right. how to how to do the right thing. Well, thank you so much, Mary and Steve, for being on the show tonight. I wish we had more time, but we're out of time. Fantastic topic. You guys are experts. Thank you. Thank you. It's now time for a Veterans Voice, our special segment where veterans can share what's important to them. Tonight we bring you a compelling story of two friends, Denny and Rod. Hi, we're back to Veterans Voices. Nathan Johnson, host of the show here, along with Denny Briggs and Rod Odgers, two Navy veterans. And so, Denny and Rod, thank you for being here today. And uh, I know a little bit about you, uh, but let's start off, just give us a brief a uh, real brief overview of your service in the military. Well, I was actually in two times. I was in the uh, Navy uh, near the end of World War II, 
And then I got out and uh, went to college under the GI Bill, and then I uh, received a commission as a psychologist. I came back in during the Korean War, and I was in, on active duty for eight years after the Korean War. So overall, about 10 to 12 years of service well, then? 15. 15 years. Yeah. Wow, fantastic. And Rod, tell us about your service in the military. I um, served in, it, you know, went to uh, boot camp in San Diego, and that took me out of Michigan totally. I was chosen to go to core school, to hospital, hospital core school, and that was totally, was not what I wanted. But uh, I did, and I went to the core school, and then I was sent up to, uh, to Oak Knoll Naval Hospital, and uh, where I were, met Denny, and I worked in the psychiatric unit there. Well, Rod and I uh, met, I think it was about 1955, when we were uh, uh, stationed at the uh, Oak Knoll Naval Hospital on the psychiatric service. Um, Rod was uh, the leading uh, psychiatric technician on a ward that was uh, sort of nicknamed the Brig Ward because it was uh, uh, housed uh, patients that the Navy's brig on Treasure Island couldn't handle. Uh, they were so disturbed. And then they wanted to uh, repeat this program, so they chose the Naval Hospital in Japan. So I was uh, chosen to uh, uh, form a team and go there and set up an experiment. So this must have felt very special then to be a very hand-picked unique group sent on this special assignment. What, what was it like to be picked uh, by Denny and to be a young sailor and head over to Okinawa for this special mission? So I got to see all kinds of uh, mistreatment actually hmm. of uh, a lot of our veterans, you know, people mm -hmm. who were there for and I was assigned to a different ward and they were having different kinds of therapy, a lot of chemical therapy like insulin shock and they were doing uh, electric shock and uh, they were isolating people and they were, um, you know, I remember wrapping sheets around the patient, you know, uh, I remember, mm. you know, it, it was all pretty horrible to me. Mm. It was pretty confining and frightening to me if I were ever, ever in that kind of a situation. Well, this must have been very early in the times of understanding mental health and yes. certainly pre-existing any type of maybe specific diagnosis. And it was before the anorectic drugs. It was, bef it was even before Thorazine. And, mm -hmm. uh, really quite dangerous uh, mm -hmm. kinds of procedures. Several of the patients died at, at Oak Knoll and while we were there in, uh, uh, in um, uh, insulin coma where they couldn't resuscitate them out mm. of the coma. Wow, it's so a very it was scary a too. terrible place. Yeah. And while we were at Oak Knoll, this one experiment on the ward, we were able to eliminate uh, all these things. We had uh, uh, no electric shock, no insulin, no uh, restraints, none of this sort of thing. Okay. We handled everything uh, in, in the ward in groups. I see. So, uh, through maybe the early uh, interventions of talk therapy and sitting folks down and discussing what they were going through, is that was that the idea, the uh, main strategy? Yes. And what was your overall goal? Were you trying to develop something uh, as an alternative to what the Navy was already using? Were you trying to? Were you specifically working on just the toughest, the the hardest? Um, cases to crack, for lack of a better term, or what was well, the main objective that you guys walked away from? To me, it was to give everybody the same integrity, you know, mm -hmm. integrity of life, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, hallucination was normal for some people. I mean, that's the way they operated, you know. I remember some of the catatonic patients that would just sit there very rigid or lie there very rigidly and, you know, not move, you know, kind of thing. And these were all, to me, uh, it looked like uh, punishment more than it was uh, 
you know, help or mm -hmm. assistance or anything. Were there any success stories? Did you see? Oh, well, definitely. Did you see anyone that you helped who who walked mm -hmm. away healthy and maybe mm -hmm. continued their service in the Navy or maybe were at least able to go home and live a normal life? Well, it's just one of them. I remember uh, it was a catatonic and. I didn't know anything about cat. I, I had no college. I barely made it through high school, let alone going through uh, to know any of this uh, psychology of all this. But I just knew that this person was lying there. So I used to read to him, I had no, you know, and I thought, well, he might be communicating somehow. Mm -hmm. And when he did start developing, uh, you know, uh, leaving that, whatever that is, whatever they call that, you know. He became very active in the ward for a while, and then uh, he was discharged. And he used to write me letters, you know, remembering everything that I did. And so that in itself was bringing, you know, how you could help somebody. And so, from these successes, how do you think that the mental health world advanced, or how, you know, through your research or um, your direct practice? How did you mm -hmm. see the care for our service members? Um, improved through the 50s or even well, through the, later years? From the, these uh, uh, early studies, uh, Oak Knoll was the psychiatric treatment center for the whole West Coast and the, and the Far East. We, had, we treated about 500 at any one time, and uh, the, the total service was converted into uh, uh, these kind of units. We did away with shock uh, treatment. We did away with insulin coma and, and restraint and uh, r ran these wards, you know, like uh, uh, for normal human beings. Yeah, fantastic. And it spread to other naval hospitals. Yeah. I think nearly every naval hospital had at least one unit like okay. this in time. It became a best practice. Yes. So I thank you both for being on the show, Denny and Rod. Uh, thank you for being here today and sharing your voice with us. And we'll be back with more Veterans Voices. So you just watched part one of Denny and Rod's story. Stand by for part two next month. If you'd like to participate in a Veterans Voice, email or call our producers for a chance to share your story. Yet it. Something you want to say? Yeah, there was. A, we got a phone call that we weren't able to address, but I, I will. I'll do it on the air real briefly. Somebody asked if there was a national registry for service animals. The answer is no. What you'll find are websites on on the net that actually will tell you that they're going to register your service animal, but they're none of them are connected together. It's not a national registry, and really all they're doing is taking a fee to give you a card that says you have a service animal. Very good. The, the county does license you. Does provide license for service animals and emotional, uh, excuse me, for um, actually working dogs uh, through uh, through legislation. So, that, so contact the county uh, for any information on that. But I, but there is no national registry for service. So dogs. we're behind on time tonight. So tonight we discussed many organizations and websites. Check out these resources on our website. Many of them up there: ARF, Operation Freedom Paws, uh, different several different organizations that help you. Pets for Vets through the county. Check out these resources on our website. In the, in the next several weeks, there are many veterans events occurring around the Bay Area. We have a, an abundance of crab feeds. The crabs are in, so I would suggest you go to our website and look it up. We have several crab feeds in the area that would love to have you come and partake in their fundraisers, uh, support our uh, local veteran organizations. Tune in next month when we'll be airing our special episode on relationships and how military service members and how military service can affect them. Start thinking about your questions for the show. And if you'd like to be a guest, contact our producers. Uh, this is not real fur, it's fake fur. I'd like to thank our guests and their service dogs for joining us tonight. They're walking right in front of the camera. Uh, to watch, rewatch this episode, check back on our homepage later this week or check your cable providers. I want to thank Sam for keeping my feet warm. This is Veterans Voices of Contra Costa wishing you all a good night and thank you for serving.